Hello, Fast Fam. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Craig Lieberman, and I've been tinkering on cars since 1980. I've owned more than 40 cars in my life. Some were heroes, some were zeros. But never in my wildest dreams would I ever guess that three of my cars would go on to star in a motion picture franchise. My Supra, my GTR, and my Maxima all had starring roles in Universal's Fast and Furious movies. Over the next three years, I'd serve Universal as a technical advisor. I helped choose the cars, procure the parts, oversee their builds, and support both production and post-production. I have some cool stories to tell about what it was like to build these cars and to work with the cast. I was there, on set, in the production meetings, working on cars, hanging with the actors, and consulting on post-production. So follow along as I tell the stories. Let's jump in. So today I'm talking about probably the best car of the first Fast movie. You know which car I'm talking about? No, it's not my Supra. No, it's not Dom's Charger. I'm not talking about Brian's Eclipse. So what car am I talking about? I'm talking about a car that only appeared on screen for less than two minutes. Do you know what car I'm talking about now? Yep, I'm talking about Leon's GTR. As a technical advisor for the first Fast and Furious movie, one of my tasks was to help Universal choose the best JDM cars of that time and to suggest which car should be assigned to each actor, which was no easy job. And so we, we kind of toiled over that. But you also have to understand that the budget was pretty limited. The total picture car budget was $1 million. That includes buying all the cars that we would need, including stunt cars. And just buying the cars cost us more than $340,000. And remember, the $1 million includes wheels, body kits, racing seats, steering wheels, everything that we put on the cars, painting the cars, buying the paint, all that kind of stuff. That story is coming up right after the break. Have you ever Googled your name? If you have, you were probably shocked to see some of your personal information floating around for the whole world to see. Every once in a while, I Google myself just for fun. I'm always surprised what kind of things are floating around the internet. It's just creepy that these companies have this information on me. So this is what they do. These data brokers are making money hand over fist by selling your info to robocallers, spammers, and in some cases, much worse. This is why I'm talking about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers who are exposing your information and then submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do that. So let Aura handle all of it for you. Now you can get off of all of those lists. You can try Aura free for two weeks using my link here below, aura.com slash Craig. Aura does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you can't even see. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to bother downloading several different apps just to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft, insurance, and even more. You get everything at one affordable price. So let Aura do all the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. As I mentioned in one of my recent videos, Universal held casting calls for cars on the back lot of Universal Studios here in Hollywood, California. During one of these car casting events, Sean Morris, who was at the time working at a company called Motorex. If you've been following me for a while, you know what they were doing. Sean Morris was able to convince Motorex to bring a couple of GTRs to one of the car casting calls. Sean managed to bring up an R32 GTR and an R33 GTR. The uh, R32, I think it was silver color, and at the time, the R33 was white and running a stock engine. So it didn't look very fancy. A lot of people said it looks like a 240SX. What's so great about it? Of course, I was already familiar with the Nissan GTRs. I had read magazines. I've watched option videos and played these cars and video games, especially in Gran Turismo. So I know all about these cars and the history, going back to the R32s. But the production team had never heard of these cars. They had no idea what those cars were. It was just kind of 
a Nissan with the steering wheel on the wrong side. <laughs> but you gotta remember, back then, the people that traditionally building the cars for movies and television, they only knew about muscle cars because that's what they were doing for the last 30 years. And so, for action movies or action television show, 99% of the cars that you would see on screen were from the 1960s all the way to the 1990s. They were all muscle cars, or Camaros, Dodge Chargers, Firebirds, all the kind of stuff, Mustangs and all that kind of stuff. Sean talked to the production team and we all agreed that we should find a place for a GTR in this movie because this car is very, very, very special. And at first, when we got behind closed doors, I suggested that Dominic Toretto should use the GTR in the first race. And for a moment, the director thought about using it for Brian's car. My boss, Dave Martyr, at that point asked me about the cost of one of those cars at the time. An R33 was around $30,000. That high price was about $10,000 more than we pay for any of the cars and that high price was already a problem just at that. Don't forget that we were gonna need at least four cars, including three stunt cars. So that's a big, big junk of money. That's $120,000 just for four cars. Secondly, the steering wheel being on the right side would not work on the street race lineup for the shots and camera angles that they envisioned. But the final disqualifier was that we needed a car with a target top for the highway rescue scene. So this car would not be suitable to replace my Supra. So that means this car was gonna be a secondary car for another character, so that was at the end of that. Additionally, we were on a tight schedule and we were told that the only way to get three more R33s over here would take about one to three months by boat, <laughs> which is not gonna work. We could have had them shipped by air freight, but it would cost about $10,000 more per car just to do that, and that was way out of our budget, so that was the end of that. If it's gonna be in the movie in any way, it's gonna have to be some kind of secondary car for a secondary character or something that just pulls up. As I said before, we only had a $1 million total budget for all the things related to buying and building the cars, and we had already spent over $340,000 just buying the cars, like I mentioned earlier. Just wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> but still we're trying to find a just do something with this car. And given the filming schedule and the cost considerations, we just couldn't find a way to give that car a more prominent role. So David, Martin and I had a discussion about it. We should put this car in there, but who can we give it to? So I suggested that we could rent the car for a scene or two, but for what character? David Martyr suggested that car would work for Leon. And I agreed because if you look at Leon's role, he was the guy running interference between the racers and the cops. And it was brilliant, it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we rented the card, painted the car yellow, and adorned the card with the graphics similar to the other cars that you see in Dominic Toretto's racing team. So it fit in perfectly. We didn't have to build stunt cars and all kinds of stuff. So how did this car get into the country in the first place if we couldn't get them that easily? Originally, this R33 GTR was imported by Motorex before there was even a Motorex back in 1998. This was prior to VCP-17. This was also prior to any Nissan Skylines getting a bond release through the Department of Transportation. Uh, this car was imported on a TIP, a temporary import bond on the HS7 form. Motorex went through JK Motos who filed their petition that 19 1990 to 1999 Nissan Skylines would be able to be brought into compliance with federal motor vehicle safety standards because VCP-17 wasn't published until the federal registered until January of 2000, I think it was. Motorex though was working to get this car federalized so they could start selling these cars and bring them into the United States. And that's what they were doing. Magazines and by then Motorex themselves were using this car are for test and driving impressions, not just to get federalized, but to have the motor press to start looking at these cars and hype it up in case those cars were allowed into the country legally. So while Motorex was trying to get these cars federalized, at one point prior to the final decision by the NHTSA, the officials there were asking for a fourth crash test. Crash testing is part of the federalization of a vehicle. In this fourth test, basically they wanted to see an unbelted front impact test. This test turns out 
Could be done non-destructive on a sled, but Big Bird was the car that was gonna be up for that. And so that car would have been probably crashed and sacrificed. However, the NHTSA at the last minute decided that the fourth test was a little excessive. And so we got that car. And so it was still around when we started production of the first Fast and Furious movie. Otherwise, that car would not have been in that movie at all. Despite the right-hand drive, there were no major problems on set. However, the actor who played Leon, a guy by the name of Johnny Strong, had to take a little time to get accustomed to driving the right-hand car and stop hitting the windshield wipers instead of in turn signals. <laughs> that was kind of funny. Besides Paul Walker, though, none of the cast knew what that GTR was. They had no clue. Most of the people who were extras on the first street race, a lot of them actually seemed to know the car. However, despite its short appearance in the movie, this car was very well known known to the tuner world as it turned out. We almost didn't get this car for another reason. The GTR had recently come back from the one lap of America and during the event, they killed one of the turbos. So they had a scramble to fix that turbo to get it to us just in time. The car was not on set for very long though. The, the four-way race scene took only about three or four nights. I forget, I have to look it up. But the GTR was a big hit and a lot of people, that was their first introduction to see one of those cars in the flesh. The funny thing though was that the GTR would have smoked all four cars in that race against Dominic Toretto. We know that because that car ran a 12.2 quarter mile pass down at Carlsbad Racetrack on the stock motor. No nitrous, no cheater slicks, anything. Just jumped on the gas and just shifted. That car was the fastest one on the set. I thought it was really cool to see that car in the movie because when I saw an early edit out of the movie, Leon's pulling up in a GTR was great to me. I thought to myself, that's probably the best car to lure the cops away from the street racers and it's bright yellow but they didn't write that into the script so it would be really cool if Leon took off and the cops all went after him but the way they read it it was a better way to go I guess. Unfortunately audiences didn't get to see much more of this car after that so it had its moment in the spotlight but <laughs> that was it. It was very short and fleeting and it was sad to go, but it had to go. For that car, being in the Fast and Furious was a great piece of history for the car. Once filming was done, Sean got the car back, ripped the graphics off the side of the car. He didn't like it either. <laughs> but this car was not done. It was destined to make even more history. First off, you have to remember it was one of the first R33s to come into the United States. It was in sport compact car back in January 1999. And to many, this was the first proper introduction of the Nissan GTR in the United States. First the magazine and then Fast and Furious. Now Nissan GTRs were legitimately on the map. After that, this car had many more placements in magazines, catalogs, magazine ads, and it was the most widely used R33 Skyline GTR in the United States for those kind of things. Back when the car was still white, the car competed at Pikes Peak and it was used as the HKS demo car for a while. The GTR got big love from the British magazine called Max Power UK and a nice article in Road and Track, which is a big magazine, a huge one. It had like almost 700,000 subscribers. It also got a big spread in Turbo Magazine back then. Being in that many magazines in such a short interval was a big, big deal. And this was before all the crazy car shows like all over Holland and all that kind of stuff. There was a couple of shows on TV, but back then everybody was consuming car content through magazines. The internet wasn't even a thing back then. And then when the internet got started, it was on ads for everyone from speedoptions.com to Racing Heart to XS Engineer, UPRD, and in Stellan, I think. It had even been featured in an ad for an Australian importation company doing a burnout. Here's the video. The car was a test bed from products from many companies after its movie appearance because of the R&D. The car was too tied up though to continue to bring the car into compliance with US regulations and so that kind of sealed its fate at one point. Eventually, the car wound up in the hands of a guy by the name of Justin Bino in uh, Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin. What happened next was a giant mess. <laughs> the feds stepped in when the registration of one of these GTRs was flagged. It turns out Justin Bino had a two 
R33s. One of them got tagged and flagged. Bino avoided a possible prison sentence by agreeing to the destruction of his two rare Japanese muscle cars, one of which appeared in the Fast and Furious, which we we're talking about the Big Bird. It was a long fight. Eventually, authorities seized Justin Bino's two Nissan Skylines in 2010 and intended to crush them after giving Bino a brief chance to collect a few personal belongings from inside the car. But the legal battle went on for a while. The two cars together cost Bino about 75,000 bucks, but had a sales value of about $100,000, he said. But all the fighting that went over for the next two years or so, uh, Bino uh, at that time was about 32 years old and he faced several felony counts relating to conspiracy to commit fraud and possessing vehicles without vehicle identification numbers. Bino crossed the line when he put the cars up for sale. Dot investigators spotted the purple car on eBay and then contact Bino by email pretending to be an interested buyer from, uh, I think it was Minneapolis or Milwaukee, whatever it was. So the, the guy was a fed. <laughs> <laughs> he got him. He asked Bino if he has uh, the title or can it be title? Could I get a vehicle identification number? Johnson said, we'd expect Bino to say, no, it can't be title. He's got a letter, he's been told, but he responded that upon sale and payment that you can receive a Florida title to then go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and get a title or get a title transfer for Wisconsin. So basically he was telling the feds to go commit another felony. <laughs> At that point, they know he was trying to circumvent to get around the law. So in a plea deal, he accepted responsibility for three misdemeanor counts of exchange for giving up his cars. That was the end of it. Bino stated in an interview that there's no doubt I broke some laws. He claimed it was all due to a misunderstanding. I have no problem accepting uh, consequences on the charges that were fair. But this was taken to a degree that is just absurd. In the end, when all the legal battles were done, on May 31st, 2012, the Big Bird GTR was crushed by order of the federal government along with another of Bino's GTRs. And that closes that chapter that the Big Bird was gone and then under R33 car was gone. Now people have two less, two fewer R33s that they can buy because somebody was playing the f system and that's if you want to hear more about Big Bird and its history after the movie, watch this interview that I did with Sean Morris a while back. It's a little long, but it gets into really uh, deep details. Anyway, thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. It really helps me to grow my channel and bring you more great content. I'll see you again next time.